Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so I'm here for a Friday Reads, and I have several books to talk about, so uh, I will get right to it. Um, the first is The Essential Horus. Um, this is a selection of the ancient Roman poet Horus, uh, translated by Burton Raffle, um, who I believe is a professor of classics or history. Um, he's a professor of English at the University of Denver. Um, so uh, I ended up uh, not finishing this. Um, but I mentioned my criticisms last Friday, and they just got to me too much. Uh, I couldn't go on. It was just too, it was I was basically uh, it got to a point where I was only reading this to finish it, not reading it because I had any inherent interest in it. Um, I mentioned how there are some anachronisms in the poetry itself. Um, uh, you know, the translator has Horace mentioning Beethoven's fifth in the course of a poem or mentioning soda in the course of a poem, and of course neither of those existed in ancient Rome. Um, so it just really took me out of the translation, in a sense. Um, and, uh, and I didn't like that, but also just the po as poetry, it was just not compelling. It was just kind of uh, uninspired and pedestrian, um, and just didn't do much for me. A lot of it seemed kind of like empty moralizing, not moralizing, but empty sort of almost life advice that Horace just kind of sat down to give people. And I doubt that that's how Horace necessarily reads if you read him in the original Latin. So I don't think it's the fault of Horace, I think it's the fault of Burton Raffle. Um, so uh, yeah, I will keep out an, uh, uh, keep my eye out for another translation of Horace, but this one was definitely a disappointment. Um, next is a volume uh, with uh, the poets Hesiod and Theognis. Um, so switching gears, these are uh, Greek poets. Um, Hesiod was alive around the time of Homer. He's kind of a mysterious figure. Uh, in fact, there's some speculation that he may not have even written both of the works that are attributed to him. Um, included in this collection are Hesiod's Theogony, which is a traditional Greek creation myth, um, uh, complete with Zeus's struggle to overthrow his father Cronus. Um, Cronus the Titan, um, and also his poem The Works and Days, which is essentially this uh, poetic manual for uh, living as a peasant in Greece. Um, and then um, and then I'll get to Theognis after I talk about Hesiod a bit more. So Hesiod, um, his Theogony I um, enjoyed well enough. Uh, you know, I've always been intrigued by the story of how Zeus overthrew his father Cronus. Um, I, I've always, uh, you know, I, it was cool to read the primary source for that, I suppose. Um, but everything else around it, I mean, it, it's not a particularly compelling or interesting narrative. Um, the poetry itself also isn't very compelling. Um, and the, the translator, um, who is Dorothy Schmidt Wender, um, she emphasizes in her introduction that she thinks that the Theogony is vastly inferior to um, the works and days. Um, so, and based on my reading, I would definitely say that as poetry, that is definitely true. Um, so I liked reading the primary source for the story of Zeus overthrowing his father, but aside from that, there wasn't much to it um, that was very interesting. You know, like, he goes on on, on tangents, like at one point he... Um, he writes for like a page and a half about the qualities of a goddess named Hecate, who I had never heard of and who I don't even remember much about because that's how uninterested I was in her. Um, so yeah, the only sort of rationalization I can come up with for the way the Theogony is with those boring um, excursions about random goddesses we don't care about is that it was kind of a religious hymn and um, so it worked that way, um, but I don't know that. Um, but then the works and days um, was better as poetry, you know, line by line. It was much more, uh, much more uh, pleasant to read. Um, and the first three or four pages, maybe five pages, were definitely interesting. They so the works and days is kind of a, a poetic manual for living a good life as a Greek farmer. Um, not as a Greek peasant, a Greek farmer, because he does mention having servants and stuff. Um, so probably not a peasant. Um, but, uh, so in, in the opening pages, he kind of talks about the fall of man, the sort of Greek version of the fall of man, and, um, and, uh, why, why humans suffer so much, essentially, and, um, or why men suffer so much, essentially, uh, because part of what the philosophy that's, uh, kind of espoused in working days is that women were essentially sent as a punishment for men, um, to make their lives miserable, um, because the Greeks are notoriously sexist, what can I say? Um,
And, um, yeah, so that opening section where uh, you get kind of an insight into the just Gre general Greek outlook on life was very interesting. Um, but the rest of it kind of, you know, like he, there's several pages talking about how to farm and when's the best time to farm and what are the best farming practices are. And it might be written nicely, but it's not very interesting. Um, I kind of was just reading for the sake of getting to the end, um, for the majority of the works and days. Um, so yeah, that was also a bit of a disappointment. Um, and then there's Theognis, who, um, was a poet who lived in the 500 B 500s BC, and who is also kind of a mysterious figure. Um, we don't know much about him biographically, um, but he left behind a huge set of elegies, of very short elegies. So, um, if you can see those, um, each one of these stanzas you see here is one of his poems, so uh, they're very short, um, which is nice. I like short poetry, but, um, you know, a lot of these, you know, uh, in her introduction, um, in the introduction by the translator, um, she is, uh, talks about what these poems are about, and they often discuss kind of the outlook of a Greek aristocrat, um, which is what Theognis the was. He was he was an aristocrat, so it's kind of the the um, contrast to Hesiod, who was uh, giving the outlook of a farmer. So um, we have Theognis with his aristocratic background. Um, and, um, but the translator emphasized in her introduction that it's more than just a sort of historical piece about what a, the aristocracy's outlook would have been. Um, because, you know, he talks a lot about, um, you know, what to think of peasants, what to think of poor people, what to think of uh, drinking, what to think of sex, what to think of romance, in a very kind of moralistic, um, doling out, um, judgments way. And, um, the translator emphasized that, 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 they're good to read for more than just an insight into the outlook of these people, um, that they are good poetry in their own right. And at times, I agree, um, there were some poems in here that I liked, um, but so many of them were just irrelevant or, I mean, relevant certainly to then, but not very interesting to read now. Yeah, um, on the whole, this was a bit of a disappointing volume. Um, I might reread some of the poems of Theognis and see what I make of them on a second reading. Um, but on the whole, I wasn't too, too into them. Um, so yeah, there's that. Um, next is another Greek poet, um, The Odes of Pindar. Um, so, uh, Pindar actually wrote a lot more than just what is in this volume, uh, a lot of other, uh, poems in other forms, um, but the, his odes are all that survive. And, um, so he wrote these odes on the, in, uh, sort of on commission for different people when they, uh, won a victory at, uh, athletic games, um, including the Olympic games, but not only the Olympic games. Um, and, you know, I, I first heard that, uh, that that's what these poems are about, were these odes praising these athletes after their victories, and thought, okay, that sounds a bit boring. Um, but they are a lot more than just that, um, because he, he, you know, he spends very little of each poem actually talking about the athlete in question. Um, you know, he uh, goes on tangents about mythological tales, um, and so you get to experience some of these mythological tales. He, um, and you'd be surprised what kind of profound insights he ends up finding from these mythological tales and relating them to the, uh, real lives of people. Um, and, um, and the translation is also beautiful, I think. Um, uh, well, maybe a bit uneven. Um, there are times where it's better than other times. But, um, I just have one, uh, this is the first stanza of, um, the beginning of an ode. Um, so this is the Pythian Ode, uh, number nine. So, um, these different odes are named a after what kind- what games they were, uh, they were written after. Um, so these are- this one's one written after the Pythian games. Um, and so this is the first stanza of it. I wish to proclaim aloud the bronze-shielded Pythian victor, and the deep-zoned graces shall help me cry his name. Telesicrates, fortunate man, crowning the brows of Kyrene, the horse-taming maiden, her whom once Leto's long-haired son snatched from the wind-swept glades of Pelion. Carrying her off, wild girl, in a golden chariot, he made her queen of a country of many flocks and all kinds of fruits to inhabit the third fixed continent of Earth and blossom in a lovely land.
So yeah, I think that that's just beautiful, and there are a lot of passages like that in here, um, so if that appeals to you, you might like it. Um, and, and he also finds some real profundity at times. Um, you know, uh, just some quotes I pulled that I thought were, that I underlined, um, from various poems. Uh, as many as men are the different destinies that yoke each to his doom and hold him. Um, and then one more, uh, we must ask from the gods things suited to hearts that shall die, knowing the path we are in, the nature of our doom. Um, so yeah, I did end up enjoying the Odes of Pindar much more than, uh, these other, um, the other two Greek poets I read. Um, and, uh, they are, they can be kind of difficult, um, because the way he talks about the mythological tales can be kind of disjointed and non-linear. Um, he kind of assumes that you know these myths, you know, because he was writing for an audience who would have known the myths. Um, so I wouldn't recommend the Odes for someone who knows nothing about Greek mythology. Um, but if you do at least have a rough knowledge of, uh, you know, of a rough grounding in Greek myths, I think, uh, these poems are quite enjoyable. And there are, there are footnotes to each poem, which are, can, um, kind of explain, uh, things as you go. Um, so if you can find a volume like that, um, that might be helpful. Um, so yeah, the odes. Um, next is, uh, one that I started. Um, so this is the book I'm currently working on. It's, uh, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Blood Meridian or The Evening Redness in the West. Uh, it's much underrated, in my opinion, alternate title. Um, so this was published back in 1985. Um, I've heard from many places that it's Cormac McCarthy's masterpiece. I've also heard from many places that it's a piece of crap. <laughs> um, so uh, I was interested to see what I would make of McCar Cormac McCarthy, because I know he's not without his detractors. Um, so, uh, and, um, so Blood Meridian takes place in the uh, mid-1800s. It's about a, an unnamed boy from Tennessee who kind of decides to leave his father um, and just kind of go to Texas to kind of make his fortune. And uh, eventually he falls in with this uh, sort of gang of scalp hunters, um, this gang of pe men who go around uh, basically killing Indians and uh, taking their scalps and selling them for money, essentially. So, yeah, so far I'm about 120 pages into it. Um, it started off very engaging, it's fast-paced at first, um, when the boy leaves his home and kind of, uh, starts to get involved in scraps, um, but it's kind of leveled off now, um, it's not as gripping, um, but at the same time it is easy, easy reading, um, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward prose, um, so in this, in this book, uh, uh, Cormac Marthy leaves off a lot of apostrophes and doesn't use any quotation marks, and, um, so far, my impression of that is uh, that it really gives this novel a very kind of dreamlike, almost unearthly quality to it. To it, um, and uh, and I, I kind of like that. It, it gives it a sense almost that it's this um, parable or myth that um, you know was found written on a scroll in the middle of the desert by some unnamed author, and uh, that we just kind of have as this document that is mysterious and that we don't know anything about. Um, which is interesting because, um, you know, this is supposed to be kind of an anti-Western, and if you think of a Western as, like, an American myth, um, the kind of myth that might be written on a scroll like that, um, and yet this is an anti-Western, so it's an anti-myth. So it's almost ironic that it feels that way, that it feels like it must be some kind of a myth or a parable, or a, or a more moralistic parable. Um, so uh, that's interesting, and um, and then there's the very flowery prose, um, very kind of um, poetic prose, I guess we might say. Um, although I have mixed feelings about this poetic prose, um, I feel like sometimes it can be a bit empty. Um, you know, like it seems like prose where Cormac, it, it it is prose that comes off as someone who wants to sound poetic um, rather than just being poetic in itself. Um, so anyway, I, I, I don't know, I'm only 120 pages in, so I will see what I think at the end of the book, but so far I am enjoying it, I will say that. Um, I am enjoying the story, mostly. Um, so yeah, Blood Meridian. Um, and last two books I want to talk about very quickly are just two books that, um, I'm reading for class, actually. So I'm taking a class right now called Brain and Behavior. And, um, I have t one book that all of us in the class have to read is, uh, Phantoms in the Brain by, uh, V.S. Ramachandran and Sandra Blakesley. 
Um, so in this book, uh, V.S. Ramachandran is a medical practitioner, uh, and he also has a PhD, and uh, he works with patients who have um, brain damage or some kind of a brain disorder. And so in this book, he and Sandra Blakesley have uh, written the narrative of many of the cases he's worked with um, through his time as a medical practitioner and um, kind of discusses what these abnormal cases of brain damage can tell us about the typical human brain. Um, and uh, yeah, so far I'm 20 pages in, I'm really liking it. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, there's that. And then the second book is one that, uh, uh, so for this class we all had to pick um, another book to read on our own and then we have to give a presentation on it. So the book that I picked was a Consciousness and the Brain by Stanislas Dehaene. Um, <clears throat> so Stanislas Dehaene is actually from France, and he studies consciousness. He's a, a psychologist in neuroscience, it's not a scientist. And um, so this book is about how our brains, uh, our physical brains, create the seemingly meta metaphysical experience of consciousness. Um, and uh, just the research that has been done on that, and... Uh, and where it's going and what it means for us as humans if we can figure out how the brain creates consciousness and um, yeah, it, it should be fascinating. Um, so yeah, these two I don't know how much I'm going to talk about um, on the channel um, just because I'm reading for them for school and I'll already have, be having to discuss them and, and read them deeply for school so um, but I may kind of mention them in a Friday reads when I finish them. Um, but so yeah, um, so that is what I am reading. Um, sorry for the long video, uh, if anyone's even still watching. Um, but uh, anyway, I will uh, see you all next week, and um, thank you for watching. And uh, let me know if you have any thoughts on any of these books, of course, if you've read them. Um, so, yeah, thanks guys. Bye!